This year's scope lecture is not just a scope lecture, it's also the inaugural of the Department of Mathematics Distinguished Lecturer Series. So to introduce our scope lecturer and first ever Department of Mathematics Distinguished Lecturer, I welcome Department Head Luke Helmick. <coughs> On behalf of the department, I would like to add my welcome to those of Provost Nielsen and uh, Dean Salomon. Uh, we were pleased to see so many of our alumni and friends uh, this morning at the branch and also here this afternoon. One friend of the department who traveled and especially one way to be here is uh, Dr. Don Sari. We are extremely fortunate to have him here with us today. Don currently serves as Distinguished Professor of Mathematics and Economics and Director of the Institute of Mathematical Behavioral Sciences at the University of uh, California and Irvine. When it comes to a discussion of voting methods, he would be hard pressed to find a more appropriate presenter than Don. He is widely cited in both academic and popular publications as an expert on the mathematics behind voting methods. The author of 11 books, Two of it that we will be for sale outside this door after the lecture. Don is also a member of the National Academy of Science, a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, a Guggenheim Fellow, past chair of the U.S. National Committee of Mathematics, and past chief editor of the Bulletin of the American Mathematical Society. He has received numerous honorary doctorates from the New University, Université de Caen, Michigan, and Michigan Techno Technological University. A native of Michigan's Upper Peninsula, Don received his BS from, in mathematics from Michigan Technological University, his master's and PhD from uh, Purdue University in mathematics. He was a member of the faculty of Northwestern University for more than three decades before moving to UC Irvine in 2000. He continues there his research in areas including the n body problem, the border count, and the application of mathematics to the social sciences. Committed to excellence in teaching as well as research, Dylan is particularly proud of his numerous teaching awards, including being selected twice by Northwestern students as the university's most influential professor. I'm told he's also very excited that last week when Northwestern's football team we are back in the national ranking after a long, long absence. <laughs> now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very pleased to introduce Don Sarri. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, what I would also like, a very, very kind introduction and uh, kind comments from all of you, and I appreciate it. I thank you very much. And indeed, right now, Northwestern is playing. They're, uh, they've been playing now for a good 35 minutes, and I've got some people over here that are going to be signaling what's the score. <laughs> yes, they're 5 nothing. They're playing Michigan State. But I'm glad that the, the introduction didn't make any bad puns on my name, you know, I'm sorry, you know. <laughs> I, you can imagine how I had all sorts of them all the time growing up and, and uh, in school and that. And, and in fact, well, as a graduate student, a very shy graduate student, as you can tell, uh, what I did is I finally got enough courage and said, would you, would you marry me? <laughs> and she said, what? <laughs> and be sorry? for the rest of my life. <laughs> Fortunately, she said yes. <laughs> We've been married and then great time, great time. Well, let me tell you what I'm not going to talk about. I'm going to talk about the mathematics, the chaotic, the mathematics of voting, and what voting does and what it doesn't do. I'm not going to talk about this very, very chaotic year which we've had when we've had a cast of thousands, it seemed like. Uh, <laughs> and, and one year, I think it's this one year has been a couple of years, hasn't it? Uh, and it's been chaotic. But that I'm not going to talk about, uh, after, even though we now have reduced down to two. And when you vote, by the way, I just learned one thing in North Carolina. North Carolina is now a battleground state, and I just learned one thing today. If you vote straight party ticket, go back. You're not voting for the president. So you've got to go back and mark those separately, as I just discovered today. 
yeah, you marked straight party ticket and you're not voting for president is what I just learned today. So you've got to be careful on that. But what I'm going to do instead is talk about something more fundamental. What we do is we go all around the world, people travel. We try to find our ways to register our opinion, to register our vote. And the question that I'm going to consider today is, in elections, do we really elect whom we want? Now, you know, I come from Northwestern and from the Chicago area, and I'm not talking about that. <laughs> <laughs> you know where you would pick up on the day of elections, you would hear, vote early, vote often. <laughs> <laughs> and where the registration, voter registration was very, very lax, where you didn't even have to be alive to vote. <laughs> okay. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about something far more fundamental. Uh, about whether or not, even if everything goes correctly, even if everybody's voting sincerely, will the election outcome reflect whom the voters really want? Now, you're probably asking, how could that possibly be? What could go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> well, remember, Florida, year 2000, it was a time when even mild-mannered people such as me started using four-letter words. <laughs> But it wasn't the four-letter word that caused the problem, it was a five-letter word. <laughs> now, now, now think about it. In our society, where we want to encourage everyone who is qualified to be a candidate, because we need qualified people, anyone who's qualified to be a candidate, then why shouldn't we have two or three or four candidate elections? We sure do in primaries. And so the problem is not Nader. The problem was really that our voting system did not accurately reflect the views of the voters. It's far more fundamental. And as I will be trying to show you through this lecture, beware. In fact, as I'm going to show you, I'm going to give you good news and I'm going to give you bad news about our decision procedures, our election procedures, etc. But I'm going to tell you beware because I'm going to show you how easy it is to inadvertently make a bad, bad choice that these are not anomalies. These are fundamental laws in the way we decide. And make bad choices where? Well, I assume a lot of you here are, for example, uh, make decisions in your daily life, maybe as executives, maybe as scientists, maybe as engineers, whatever. And where can things go wrong? Everywhere. Elections is just one special case of what I'm going to discuss. I'm going to concentrate on elections because they're easier for us to understand. We have an intuition about elections. But really everything I state carries over to business decisions, decisions in the science lab, statistics, uh -huh. <laughs> statistics, uh, football rankings, now that's very important to me, uh, since Northwestern finally is ranked, uh, <laughs> at least up till today, and everywhere where we're talking about aggregation, because I'm talking about aggregation methods. If we're voting, we're taking your opinion, your opinion, your opinion, and we're combining them all together. We're aggregating. And so anywhere where we have aggregation, you're going to have problems. That was voting, that is economics, that's political science, the ranking methods, anywhere. And all of these problems I'm going to talk about crop up. But this is getting a little hefty. I understand there was going to be a party or something. And our dean, what he did is he appointed a committee, a committee to choose a beverage of choice. All right, six people are very much health conscious. So they prefer milk to wine to beer. Five of them, they're from Wisconsin. <laughs> they prefer beer to wine to milk. And four come from California. Wine to beer to milk. Well, what happens is they vote. When they vote, six vote for milk, five vote for beer, four vote for wine. So the outcome is pretty clear. They get into the car, drive down to the local beverage store to buy a keg of milk. <laughs> when they get there, they're, they're told, are you lucky you didn't want beer? 
because we had some NC State alumni here last night. <laughs> they just wiped us out. And I think they were in a room next to mine last night. <laughs> well, what difference does it make if we don't have beer? Because the voters have spoken. They have milk as first place and wine as last place. So clearly, they're going to choose milk. I mean, that's obvious, isn't it? <laughs> or is it? Let's, let's take a look. Milk, let's see. Other uh, six, uh-oh, the other nine prefer wine. And what we end up with, and this is an example I concocted to show the dangers of what can happen. What ends up here is 60% of these people, nobody changed their opinion, 60% of them prefer last place wine to first place milk. We're using the procedure, remember, to get milk, wine, beer, the procedure that we use in all of our departments, the procedure we use in our, all of our universities, that we use in our elections, everywhere else. And yet, last place milk, wine, is preferred by a landslide to first place milk. Anomaly. So let's try to find out what happened if we have milk and beer. Milk, beer. Again, 60% of these same people end up referring last place, I mean, beer to first place milk. What we have is a disturbing situation with a very simple example. What we have is that milk is in first place, and yet these voters, these voters prefer anything to milk. <laughs> <laughs> so do I. <laughs> one more. There's only one more pair, so let's see what happens. Beer and wine. Let's see. Beer and wine. Ah, uh, there we go. Two-thirds of the people really prefer wine to beer. Now, if that doesn't trouble you, I'm bothered. <laughs> because what happens is, what we are using is we're using our standard voting procedure that we use every year in the departments and everything else. And what do we have is, in pairwise comparisons, the outcome is exactly the opposite, precisely the opposite. Now, you look like, Benton, you look like you like beer. <laughs> I'm occasion, I have to have some. He wants beer. And so he's looking at my example here, and he's saying, well, oh, that's fine, that's dandy. You elected wine, you looked at uh, milk, but what happened to beer? Can anyone tell me, help me elect beer? Can anyone help me elect beer here? Pardon? If you weight the votes, that's one way of doing so. There's an easier one, one which uh, we use all the time in our, uh, uh, in, uh, our elections. A runoff election. See, if we have a runoff election, what's going to happen with the plurality, we're going to get rid of wine on the first step. And I already showed you that between milk and beer, that beer is going to win. What we have then is with an absolutely trivial example, rather than reflecting the views of the voters, the election outcome more accurately reflects which voting method you happen to choose. This is voting. I gave a similar example of this. Instead of milk, wine, beer, I had Milwaukee, uh, Washington, and Boston. And I showed executives Business executives, you want to select a place to locate a plant. Here's your data. Instead of voters, what we had our criteria. Where would you locate this plant? One person told me that indeed what we do is we have excellence. We look for excellence. And, and Milwaukee is the best of the best. Another person who was risk adverse ended up choosing uh, uh, beer. And we had another one who chose Wisconsin. So in other words, what happens is this same identical phenomena are, crops up in business decisions, decisions, and the uh, same thing crops up in statistics across the board. The issue is, is that we spend a considerable amount of time collecting data. 
assembling accurate, good data, and we don't concentrate on how we use that data to make a decision. And we end up making bad choices. You know, I once gave this example uh, several times to fourth graders. Now, not beer and wine. <laughs> <laughs> I used examples of the TV show's uh, preference for them. And what they did is the fourth graders can see through that problem. I can still see this one girl. She had her hand on her hip and she said, you know, when I said, well, let's try to vote, you know, which one's your favorite and raise your hand for your favorite, you know, a plurality vote that we use. And she stood up and she had her hand on the hip and she says, you really don't understand. <laughs> 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 Delightful. <laughs> what they said is that my voting system of voting for one, she says it was silly. They said, look, yes, milk has got a lot of people like milk first, but a lot of people like it last. And they said, look at wine. Wine, people like either first or second. And so these fourth graders like wine. Now, I've tried this example in fourth grade classes many times. With one exception, it worked beautifully. I tried it in fifth grade classes, sixth grade classes. When I get to seventh grade, they can't see through it. So I wonder what it is that we do with our educational <laughs> system or something else of this type. But I'm going to use the fourth grader's insight to try to give you some real world examples for all of this problem crop up. Because you might say, well, that's fine. That's dandy. You got an example. But where does it happen in the real world? Here's an example. The example is in the state of New York when Charles Buckley, the brother of William Buckley, ran on the Conservative Party for senator against two moderate or liberals. The Conservative Party never had won a senatorial race. So what happened, though, is he was like milk. Even though bottom ranked by a large, about 64, uh, uh, about 63, 64% of the people, he was top ranked by enough that he won. Voters will rebel. He was a one-term uh, senator. The next example I have comes from the state of Louisiana. Buddy Romer, what he did is he was governor. He's running for re-election in 1991. He made some controversial decisions. But look who he was running against. He was running against Edmund Edwards, the previous governor who had been indicted for financial shenanigans. And David Duke, <laughs> head of the Ku Klux Klan. Remember that election? And what happens then is he was like milk. Romer would have beaten either of the other two in a head-to-head -head election. But like wine, what he did is he came in last, and so we retreated to the crook or clan election. The crook won. And in fact, he is in the penitentiary right now. <laughs> you know, uh, and voters were rebelled because he really didn't have a chance. The next example, well, I'm, I'm of a Finnish background, and so therefore one of my favorite states is Minnesota where all the children are above average. <laughs> In the Norwegian, bachelor farmers walk down dusty roads and they take their politics very seriously. Here what we have is Hubert Humphrey's son. He was attorney general. He was running for governor. He had just won a $9 billion suit against the tobacco industry, which made the state quite well off. Was he a favorite? Right down the line. One of his opponents on the Republican side was Norm Coleman, his protege. And oh yeah, there was another one. Another one who uh, kind of wore boas. <laughs> Jesse, the body, Ventura. Exactly like milk. <laughs> I love saying that. <laughs> exactly like milk. What he did is he was bottom ranked by a large percentage of the people, but top ranked by enough. So they split the vote and he was elected. The pundits were all talking about what's going on in Minnesota. Nothing. 
It's the election method. That was what was going on. And so he won and became Jesse the Mind Ventura. <laughs> now, the next example is one that, oh, he was a one-term governor, of course. Uh, the next example is one that really bothers me. In 1970, the beautiful country of Chile was having a presidential election. The Marxist candidate was like milk, was not popular. Close to two-thirds of the people had him bottom ranked. But exactly like milk, he was elected. Voters will rebel. That, in many other circumstances that we all know about, led to the beautiful country with a long democratic history of Chile going into dictatorship for a period of time. The choice of a voting system matters. It matters a lot. So the question next is, the, I mean, I could go on and on with examples. If you want examples, just look in New Hampshire. Every primary season, you'll find examples. You, uh, take, uh, I, uh, take a look in France, where they have so many candidates. You can go on and on and on. So the real issue, and this is where mathematics comes in. Mathematics, to understand what goes wrong with these examples, how to create all possible examples, how to understand is there a solution or something, that's where we need the muscle power of mathematics. So the question is, is how do we analyze this? And the first person to question this was Jean-Charles de Borda, a French mathematician. There he is with a device in his hand. That device that he has in his hand was used to measure distances. And he got himself appointed to be chairman of the uh, French committee to determine the, length, the metric system. And that device he has in his hand was used to define the meter. And uh, he, was, uh, he fought in the American War for Independence on our side. Uh, he had a, a crewed a, or a skipper for the a fleet of six ships. Uh, very, very well known. But he worried about how in the world people were getting elected to the French Academy of Sciences. He thought inferiority was slipping in. And what was that bad voting system they used? It was the plurality vote. Now, let me try to give you some intuition why the plurality vote is so bad. Suppose tomorrow morning, our provost announces that from now on, students will be ranked according to the number of A's they receive. Sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Or what goes wrong there? What goes wrong there? Ranked according to the number of A's. They start signing up for classes where they make A's. <laughs> they start great inflation <laughs> signing up for courses where they get A's is one problem. But another one is. Every B, C, D, and I mean, every failing student is ranked the same as B. Yeah, exactly. What happens is there's a poor stu uh, student who gets all B's. And that student that got all B's is ranked below that student that got a 1A in gym and F's and everything else. Think of the plurality vote. The plurality vote is you're only allowed to register your A candidate. You're not allowed to register your B, your C, your D candidates. And because you're not allowed to register your A, your B, I mean your B, your C, your D candidates, you get outcomes precisely the same. Phenomena precisely the same as you would if we ranked students according to A's, just A's alone. What Borda claimed is that we should have weights, we should give points, we should rec recognize our second place, our third place, et cetera, candidates. And he stated that if you have three candidates, let's give two points to our first place candidate, one to our second, and zero to our last. If I have five candidates, four, three, two, one, zero. Sound familiar? Four point grading system. And what he did is argue that that's the case, except a lot of the people said, well, why those weights? 
why not 970 if you have three candidates, or why not some other choices? And the answer is that with the beverage example, nobody changing their mind, we're just going to change how many points we give to first place, second place, and zero to third. That's all we're going to change. You can end up with seven different election outcomes. Three of them have a tie, but four of them are strict rankings. And they're op one of them can be here, and the other one can be exactly the opposite. So the choice of a voting system matters. It surely doesn't reflect the views of the voters. And so the problem is, which method is the best? And take this and look at, if you're looking at rankings of universities, if you're looking at rankings of anything, the question is, is what method most accurately reflects the data? If we're looking in terms of decision making in, in, uh, in engineering or in various other places, and I work with engineers quite a bit, what method most accurately reflects the data, the input, is the issue. For voting, this problem was just recently solved by the use of mathematics, and I'll give you an indication of how I solved it. But first, I want to show you some good news, and boy, some really bad news. Let me start with the bad news. I gave an example in a couple of elections, and you might be saying, well, all right. But you know, I probably, if I had time, I could concoct some too. That's not the point. Really, there were three candidates, it turns out, that about in th sincere three candidate elections, about 70% of the th elections, there were three candidates involving three candidates that are reasonably close. You know, there's not just two candidates and one on the name that who in the world is that, but three candidates. 70% of the time, the election outcome depends on what voting method you're using. 70%, I could do better flipping a coin. What happens then is if you have more candidates, and how to prove that problem, uh, we used uh, ideas from probability and differential geometry to be able to compute the actual outcome. Uh, more candidates, the problems become far more severe. For example, here I have a very simple problem of a committee of nine. What we have is we're so, to select the faculty member who made the greatest contribution to NC State. And boy, we heard some beautiful contributions just a little while ago. So the question then is, which one uh, gave the strongest? We have a committee of nine to select it. Two of them think Ann is better than Barb, then Connie, then Deanna, to think that Ann is better than Deanna, then Connie, then Barb, etc. There you got a simple example. And the question is, who should get the prize? Well, if we vote for one, let's take a look. Ann picks up four votes, Barb picks up nothing, Connie picks up two, and Deanna picks up three. Answer is clear, Anne should win. Well, all right, what about voting for two? Ah, oh, Barb picks up a lot. She has a lot of second place votes. Barb picks up a lot of them. Barb wins. Vote for three. Well, be honest. Voting for three is just a politically correct way of saying vote against somebody, right? <laughs> you're voting for three and you're not voting for one. And take a look. If we take a look, Connie is the only one who's not bottom ranked. So Connie wins. Nine, <laughs> nine, nine voters, and we got four candidates, and we got each, uh, three of them anyway, can be the winner. Where is the mathematics hiding inside here that'll cause that, which is uh, not obvious? And the second thing is, is uh, who should be the winner? So I guess we could use the board account, three, two, one, zero, and to try to find which, who do you think is going to win, Ann, Barb, or Connie? Barb. Barb. Connie. Connie. Barb. Barb. How many think Barb's going to win? Okay. How many think Connie? Ann? Yeah, one ant. <laughs> Deanna. <laughs> <laughs> and what we have here is, 
with this one simple example, it turns out that if I use different weights, I can get 18 different strict election rankings, 18 of them. And if I allow ties, I can get about 35 of them. This very simple example. If I'm not scaring you about what happened in your last election for a department chair, for a uh, uh, whatever, in the presidential primaries or anything where there's more than two candidates, <coughs> then you should think again. And the outcomes can be significant. In fact, what happens is how likely is it? You have to expect, if, there, if it's really a four candidate election, you have to expect about 85% of the time that the election outcome will change depending on what voting method you use. The outcome does not reflect what the voters want. It reflects what voting system they happen to be using. The same thing applies now in decision analysis and everything else. All of this extends. With, you know, with nine candidates, that's the number that we had starting in some of the primaries, I can create an example using, oh, I don't know, maybe about 40 voters, where I can get up to a third of a million different election rankings. A third of a million, about 30, 40 voters, that's all I need. And the every, they've re you know, registered their votes. And all we do is just tally the ballots in different ways, and I'm going to have about a third of a million different rankings. And if we take a look at the French election, well, the French, but if we have the French election, they started with 16 candidates. And I, I, it'll take me about 200 voters to create an example here. But I can have 19.6 trillion different election outcomes. That's more than the amount of money we've lost in the last eight days. <laughs> okay. I know that wasn't funny. <laughs> I, yeah, I'm going to be re working another four years because of the last eight days. Uh, and so what we have is uh, the number of, uh, and, and to prove these kind of results, which is n minus 1 times n minus 1 factorial, uh, you have to use ideas from just uh, geometry. But what you have is the problem is severe. Let me show you how bad it is. You might be having hiring season here in uh, uh, NC State, but in California we're not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we are, we're in bad shape out there. Anyway, suppose we have a search committee and they're trying to hire. And suppose what we do is a search, or the department looks and says that, okay, nine of them prefer Ann, eight prefer Barb, seven prefer Connie, six Deanna. And so there's the outcome. Who are you going to hire? It's clear, Ann. So you get the phone ready to call you. He's at the phone right here. He's ready to call Ann. And the phone rings. And it's Deanna. And Deanna says, I got a job elsewhere. OK. So Deanna's not coming. Should you have a new election? I know of no department that would. <laughs> but let's see what happens. If Deanna out, these two voters right here are going to vote for Barb. And these two voters right here, four voters right here, are going to vote for Connie. And now the outcome is Connie gets 11, Barb 10, and 9. <laughs> oh, it gets worse. <laughs> Uh, because suppose it was Anne that called and said that she can't come. Let's take a look. Those three voters voting for Connie. These six voters voting for Deanna. Add them up, 12, 10, 8. The outcome now is Deanna is better than Connie is better. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> And in fact, what happens is if you drop any one candidate or any two candidates, and the outcome is just the opposite of what you started with. It's exactly the opposite. Try it. You can just take this example down. Try it. Drop Connie and see what happens. Or drop Connie and Deanna and see what happens. Drop any of them. I knew 
You can do it? Good. <laughs> uh, you and I are going to do it after. <laughs> okay? And then what happens is the outcome... Re now, as a mathematician, I mean, really, the outcome seems to suggest that the real outcome, what really reflects the voters' views, is Deanna is better than Connie, is better than Barb, better than Ann, just the opposite of what the election had. So who do these voters really want? Do they want Ann or do they want Deanna? My viewpoint is they want Deanna. And so for mathematicians, the question is, how bad can it get? What else can happen? And this, it really seems highly chaotic. And most of my work is, uh, has been in mathematical astronomy. That's where chaos was discovered. So I use ideas coming from chaotic dynamics, modify them, so that I can handle problems that come from probability, statistics, discrete mathematics, you know, type issues of this type right here. And I found that the outcome is incredibly chaotic. If you have five candidates, A, B, C, D, E, all right? E is going to be dropped out. I'm going to ask you to rank them in any way you want. There's A, B, C, uh, D. Who are you going to rank them in any way you want? I'll take B first. B first. Then E. Then E. And you say E's going to drop out? No, E's dropped out. Yeah, you can't okay, drop E out. Okay, D. D. C. C. And A. A, okay. And then instead of E dropping out, I'm going to ask him. I have the D uh, dropping out. A, C, D, F. Okay. <laughs> and, you know, and you see what I'm going to do is I'm going to go around and I'm going to ask each of you to come up with a different ranking for a different subset of candidates. I don't care which one it is. And you're going to try to embarrass me. And the answer is, no, nah, you won't. No matter what you state, I can create an example where the people vote. And just depending on what subset of candidates we happen to be looking at, that will be the outcome. The same thing extends to business decisions and large number of other issues. And you know what happens in statistics. If you don't, it does. <laughs> okay. And it crops up in all of these different areas. And so the issue then is, uh, that is bad. In fact, folks, it is so bad. I hope you understand that, you know, faculty members, you, uh, because we never are paid enough, what we do is we sometimes have consulting businesses. And it's so bad that I have a consulting business. And what it is, is that for a price, before your next election, I will uh, come to your organization. You tell me who you want to win. <laughs> I will talk to everyone, and I will then decide a fair election method. And your candidate will win. <laughs> now, this is a joke. It's just to show you how bad election methods are, <laughs> although I have been contacted by some politicians. <laughs> But uh, let me show you. Let me show, let me show you how this is. Suppose I have 10 people that like Ann, better than Barb, better than Connie, better than Deanna, better than Fred. I've got 10 who like Barb, better than Connie, better than Deanna, better than Elaine, better than Fred. And I've got 10 people who like Connie, better than Deanna, better than Elaine, better than Fred. I hope there's no Freds in here. <laughs> Who would you like to see me elect? Fred. Fred. Well, I'm going to have to charge more. <laughs> because everyone is unanimous. Everyone prefers Connie to Deanna to Elaine to Fred. Can anyone help me elect Fred? In a fairer method that all candidates will be considered, not Chicago style, a fair method. <laughs> Any ideas? Any ideas of how I can do this? Well, I'm going to use a method that you all have used. An agenda. I'm just going to compare things pairwise. And well, you know what you do in agenda? You compare two things, you throw away the loser, the winner is advanced. But I'm going to select the choice of the agenda in a very careful way. <laughs> 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 
Okay, now let's take a look. I'm comparing Deanna versus Elaine. Everybody prefers Deanna. Unanimously, Deanna moves ahead. I'm now comparing Deanna versus Connie. I told you that everyone prefers Connie. Connie moves ahead. I'm now comparing Connie versus Barb. Well, that's going to be a little harder. Well, there we go. Two thirds, landslide proportion. <laughs> Prefer Barb to Connie. Okay, let's see. Con Barb versus Anne. There they are. Two thirds of the people prefer Anne to Barb. And now I want to look at Anne versus Fred. Two thirds vote. What we end up with then, <laughs> what we end up with is Fred wins with a two-thirds vote <laughs> by landslide proportion. <laughs> Think about it, and you probably have recognized this in some of your own elections, in some of your own places. They, uh, and let me give you a hint for your next societal discussion group or anything else, your department or school or anything like that. Try to make sure your option comes up towards the end. <laughs> you got a better chance. In fact, what happens is that a lot of people might say that we make decisions by consensus. Well, folks, let me tell you something. You know that mathematicians are quiet, mild-mannered people. One exception, selecting a calculus book. <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> I, I, I spent my whole career staying off of committees to select calculus books because you can almost see the blood pouring underneath the, <laughs> underneath the committee room. And what happens then is that we don't vote, but we just do it by consensus. Well, let's see, Deanna versus Elaine. Well, Elaine's book, you'll get a hernia carrying at the class, so we'll take Deanna's. Deanna versus Connie's, well, Connie's book does the limit better. And you end up at the end, and you end up with the same book you always had, and you, yeah. <laughs> and you walk out of the department saying, oh, my colleagues, you're mad at their taste or anything else. And, uh, and this happens. This happens a lot. This happens in engineering. This decision analysis in engineering. Engineering, the problems are very complex. It, it's too expensive to get the rankings, the total ranking over the different criteria, you know, of the different options. So you make pairwise comparisons. And I have seen this phenomenon crop up when I've looked at data. I started off joking about my wife, and well, I really do love her. I love her a lot, but unfortunately, if I think one thing, she thinks the opposite. If I believe A, B, C, she believes C, B, A. Not bad. Weather is very nice in Southern California. Since we have opposite opinions, on election day, we can skip voting. I mean, we can go to the beach. I mean, after all, we're just going to cancel. <laughs> or are we? Are we? We want to find out if what should be ties really are ties. And so let's look at this and see. If I have the candidates A, B, C, and if I use the plurality vote, vote for one, I'm going to vote for Anne. She's going to vote for Connie. And what we're going to have is a bias against Barb. If we vote for two, I'm going to vote for Anne and Barb. She's going to vote for Barb and Connie. And we now have a bias for Barb. Try your weights. The only ones which will not give you a bias are going to be modifications or essentially the board account. With the board account, I will give two points for Anne, one for Barb, and zero for Connie. And she will give just the opposite, two, one, zero. Add them together, and you get a tie. This simple argument, notice how trivial, and here's the mathematical symmetry. You take something, and you reverse it. And that should give you a tie, is what the idea is, the Z2 symmetry. The other one was Z3, the one with the cycles. What happens is that with these mathematical symmetries, <coughs> we find out what should happen. In fact, all possible three-candidate elections can be examined or explained by 
that simple story. Here's, here's how I created this example. I created it by starting with four people wanting wine, beer, milk, one preferring that. There the outcome is pretty obvious, isn't it? It really is wine, beer, milk. To distort the outcome, I threw in reversals. I threw in five people that had one ranking and five people that had the other ranking. And there's my example. In fact, uh, what happened is, try it. You can create any number of examples in this manner. And you can now analyze election outcomes to see what went wrong and why. The problem now is resolved. Really what happens is, by using of higher dimensional mathematical symmetries, which are not that dissimilar, remember that? Remember that frustrating thing? It's not that dissimilar to this. What you're doing is the kind of mathematical symmetries and orbits of mathematical symmetries you're using is called the Reith product of permutation groups. What does that mean? You know, you got that Rubik cube, and all you got to do is get that blue on that face, and you twist it. Oh, darn, I screwed up the other face or something else like that. It's where symmetry actions that affect one face mess up what happens on another set. And so just like trying to figure out how to do the Rubik cube means you have to go through a bunch of different uh, symmetry type operations. To understand what happens in voting, you have to separate the different interactions that you have here. And the answer turns out to be very similar. The board account, the board account is the unique choice where the outcomes reflect the voters' views. That is, the reason is, is that you have the symmetry, the same number of points between first and second, second and third, etc. And that gives you the extra symmetry which so that you get rid of all of these ties. So you write down any of these symmetries that you get, orbits or symmetry groups, that should be a tie. Only the board account will give it a tie, throw it in its kernel. None of the others will. And so you can understand where all the biases and all the problems crop up now. And so the question is, there are other issues. Like, should you use the board account? At Northwestern, they said, Don, you've been lecturing and lecturing and lecturing on voting. Why don't you lecture to us? <sighs> no. They finally leaned on me, and I couldn't escape it, and so I did. Worst case scenario. You know what they did the next day? They changed the voting system to the board account. <laughs> now, I didn't want the board account. The reason is, is I understood that the other method we were using was keeping me off of committees. <laughs> <laughs> and then the board account came, and then I decided to move to California. <laughs> uh, most of my examples came from this book right here, Chaotic Elections. This was uh, written not for experts. It's written more for lay people type, more people in this group type level. And then the other one just came out last week, disposing elections. This gets rid of the problems of uh, arrows dictator that you may have heard of, or a lot of the other problems which arise. And with that, I say thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> ah, one minute over. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. You gonna hire me to come in for your next university uh, <laughs> election? <laughs> I think I'd hire you tomorrow if it was up to me. But, uh, <laughs> um, so, do I understand you right that the? So I'm gonna use my words. The the true fair election is to do it by the board account. Correct, correct. The board account has some. The board account has some anomalies but we know what they are and we know how to handle them. Any other procedure you have, any other procedure, there is a strong probability that you're going to have an outcome which does not satisfy any consistency election a statement, uh, that doesn't satisfy where the outcome just clearly is off. In fact, uh, people in engineering are, there's a couple papers based on mine where they're talking about making engineering decisions using a form of the board account. Yeah, absolutely. Do 
confusing. Did you get the primary and just go to a single election so mm -hmm. you don't have a two-stage election like we have now? You know, here's a nice pragmatic problem in terms of what would we do with our election procedure right now. First of all, pragmatically, we'll never get rid of it because we have the Electoral College. And you take a look at New Hampshire and Vermont and a lot of these other states, they would be silly to ever vote to ha change the uh, Electoral College. Why? Who's going to go to New Hampshire then? Who's going to go to Vermont? I'll guarantee you in another week, you're going to see some politician, one of the four candidates, up in Green Bay, Wisconsin, in short sleeves, with snow coming in the background, talking about their election campaign. Who would go to Green Bay? <laughs> <laughs> in the right mind, uh, and I'm from north of Green Bay. Uh, <laughs> the point is, is that it will not happen because states will lose goodies. Second problem that we have is that our campaign today is the following. We have two parties, and the candidates that come out these two parties usually reflect the ideology of these parties. That's why a lot of the people in the middle feel frustrated almost every year. I think that if what we did is use the board account, or a version of the board account, and there's reasons to use different versions of it, that if we use that, we would have candidates which more accurately reflect closer to the middle of society, and we wouldn't have some of the strong differences which we have seen in the last several elections. So part, I hope that's an answer to your question. seems like the advantage of using the method of the favorite candidate winning, in other words, the one that's the favorite of all, is it avoids the issue of gaming and of, uh, of candidates and groups taking advantage of the method to try to affect it. For example, board count assumes that all, elect, all voters will vote for all candidates, but in reality, they will realize the benefit of that and they will structure and encourage people to vote in a way that will benefit their candidate. It seems, and I, I, I don't understand the mathematics of it well enough, my, my uh, un, uninformed sense is that the advantage of just letting the one with the, get, with the favorite of the most people win is that it avoids that gaming. Explain, how does that affect well, your conclusion about he asks several very good questions here, and let me try to repeat them and bring them up. But in the, in the first place, let me first continue with the primary. Just when you were saying this, that just reminded me of something else. Uh, in the 1996 election, uh, Dole was running in New Hampshire, and he was a favorite, or, or top and second of most of the people in New Hampshire. There were nine candidates. One candidate was bottom ranked by about 65, maybe 70 percent of the candidate, uh, voters was, well, another candidate. And what happened is uh, that what happens is Buchanan won. And the Republican Party, this is where the vote for one, and the Republican Party was all upset what went wrong with the voting system. What went wrong with the voting system is they're using the vote for one. That you can so often get outcomes that clearly do not reflect the views of the voter if you vote for one. Now, he asked a couple of other questions. He says, what about in the board account? What's going to stop you from, if you have five candidates, just voting for one? Very simple. What you do is, if you're going to vote for the board account, really your vote is to give a differential over what you had before. So if there's five candidates, four, three, uh, let's say six candidates, and you're going to vote for the top five, five, four, three, two, one. If I vote for three candidates, it'll be three, two, one. If I vote for one candidate, it'll be one. If you don't do that, you are highly, highly encouraging people to be strategic and to uh, truncate their ballot, just as you stated. But once what you do, no, it's not in the board account. That was a good question you raised. But once you understand, as I said, once you raise an issue, by understanding the mathematical structure, we can now go and analyze it to try to figure out what goes right and what goes wrong. Second thing. What about strategic voting? You can still vote strategically. Well, 
I, I'm a mathematician. I don't care what method comes out best. I'm looking for the mathematical structures of decision analysis. So I had a reward out for my students to find something bad about the board account. They said, well, what about strategic voting? And so I analyzed it, and it turned out that the plurality vote is the worst. And the board account was the least likely to be susceptible to uh, this. The reason is, again, symmetry. Remember, remember that problem? Here's a rectangle of area one. What rectangle of area one has the smallest perimeter? Square, right? What ellipse has the smallest circumference? A circle. Symmetry gives you the smallest boundary. But if you're going to be strategic, you've got to jump over the boundary. And it is precisely the symmetry of the board account which minimizes the likelihood of being successful manipulator. And if that's not enough, I'll give you about four or five other ways to try to handle this issue. But indeed, I'll, thank you for that good question. Indeed, what happens is, as I stated, once, you, you know, once we understand the mathematical structure behind these issues, you give a pragmatic problem, and an answer should be forthcoming within 24 hours, not two years like it has been in the past. Isn't there a presumption in the board account that the candidates are scaled according to the numbers? For example, if you had a sure. four-person election with Hilda Hunt, Amos Todd, Adolf Hitler, and Mother Teresa, <laughs> you're forcing me to say who is good among the others and get two bad ones. No, they, you would have truncated balling, ba uh, balloting then, and we would have exactly as he stated here. And also, as I stated for the math department, when we had uh, 1,000 candidates, uh, then we had four positions, we used the board account only for, you could vote for four, and you would have four, three, two, one. So there's many ways to get around that. Uh, there's another way, a question which is associated with it. Why don't you give me 10 points? And let me just split the 10 points in any way I want. Oh, is that horrible. Is that a horrible, I thought that was a great method. See, the trouble is, is that a method that you might think is great because it allows you to reflect your views can be bad from a societal viewpoint. We know that that method is bad because a version of it was used in figure skating. Enough said. <laughs> okay, and so we know that these things are bad. And from a mathematical perspective, since most of you have had you know, science and mathematics, think of what an aggregation method is. An aggregation method is where you take a, uh, I don't have a sheet of paper here, but if you take a big, big dimensional thing, your preferences, yours, yours, all of them, and we squeeze it down. And you try to put it down on top of a ranking on the paper. Well, it's going to be a lot of overlap, depending on how you squeeze it and position it. Think of the board account as finding the right orientation for putting that paper down. Because the right things go in the kernel. Now, think if I give you too many more options. Instead of a sheet of paper, I've got a cardboard box full of things. And I've got to try to squeeze it down. When the domain becomes much, much larger, what happens is when you try to squeeze it down, you have much more overlap and paradoxes are all over the place and some of them you cannot avoid at all. Anyone else? Yeah. Um, what about uh, the concordat method? Where you Which one? The concordat method. Contrasay? Sorry? The contrasay method? Oh, I suppose it was French. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> where, you, where you treat, uh, you can show a selection of multiple candidates I live in, uh, uh, you know, in Orange County, and that was the home of John Wayne. And the fact that our airport, there is a picture of, I mean, a picture, there's a great big statue of John Wayne walking down, ready to pull it up <laughs> and let him have it, you know. And the Condorcet method is really the John Wayne method of voting. What you do is each candidate goes against each other, and the winner, the one still standing at the end, is the winner. So a Condorcet winner is the per candidate that best wins, that wins the most elections, pairwise elections. All of them, you have to win all of them. Sounds pretty good, sounds very good, and when I started in this field, I thought that was the gold standard. But it turns out it has very bad properties. 
Let me try to give you a sense of this because I am running over. But, and I'm taking these ideas now and I'm carrying it over into multi-scale analysis in terms of nanotechnology, et cetera. Kenneth Arrow wrote the impossibility theorem, a very important impossibility theorem, and he essentially said that what Condorcet wants to do can't be done of making pairwise decisions. In other words, the whole need not resemble the sum of the parts is what it has. And the same method, you can show where you get an outcome that nobody would accept when you saw the raw data. It's very subtle, very high, and you know, I'll show you a little bit after where that crops up. But what happens is these methods, these voting methods, they sound simple. I have to admit that the total arrogance of a mathematician, I went in the field and said, all right, maybe a month, <laughs> maybe a year, maybe a decade. <laughs> All right, a couple of decades later, I finally have found out what's going on. They're hard problems. And the problems and the ideas and the symmetries that here, they extend over into engineering and decision analysis and other types of processes on there. And the question that you raised is a very natural one, but it's, uh, we can finally now answer them. So with that, I think that's it. Thank you. That was extraordinary.